When they built a mosque like the Suleimania, they were doing it to say, yeah, I've got the power, I've got the money, I am the sultan, I'm the king of kings. But at the same time, there was also tremendous spiritual value in these things. The symbolism is not only that of empire, but of faith. In the spirit of Muhammad's teaching, the great mosque was a center of social services, complete with a hospital, school, and library. At its inauguration, it said Suleiman gazed at it with awe and exclaimed, O oh, Solomon, I have surpassed thee. No less impressive was Suleiman's palace. Topkope was both the seat of government and his private dwelling. Suleiman was also a great patron of the arts. And since the empire was very rich, the best artisans were there. So everything started flourishing. The architecture uh, or the arts of his period uh, show the first golden age of the Ottoman world. Everything that came out of his palace is exquisite. Suleiman himself was a goldsmith. Ottomans believed that every sultan had to have a tangible trade. Being a sultan was not considered a practical or a tangible trade. And he was a very demanding patron, insisted on checking the work, even commissioned few things. And I think each artisan group or each corps uh, working for the palace try to outdo one another to please the Sultan, because to please him had wonderful rewards. And the Ottomans, of course, exercised quite a lot of influence on the European imagination, and the royal and the political, if you will, ceremony and pomp of the Ottomans was such that it would have humbled um, any citizen of the known world then. Uh, this was arguably one of the greatest uh, world empires and European observers could not walk away without feeling of respect for the sheer power of the Ottomans. In public, Suleiman required that all those around him remain completely silent, while he made his wishes known with the slightest nod or gesture. It must have been a tremendously impressive sight to see the courtyard of the palace filled with some six or seven thousand janissaries and other functionaries, no one saying a word. What was going on here was the creation of a sovereignty so mysterious and yet so far-reaching as to be seen as nearly divine. As Suleiman's power grew, his lifelong friend Ibrahim rose in the court structure. And Ibrahim Pasha, who became a Pasha later on, became his devoted Grand Vizier. In fact, Ibrahim married his sister. So they were not only good friends, they were also uh, related. Ibrahim campaigned with his own army, growing in influence and ambition, till his power was second only to Suleiman's. But for power and ambition, the secret world of the Sultan's harem had no equal. Contrary to the Western stereotype, it was not the Sultan's playpen, but lay at the center of dynastic power. The harem was the private quarters of the Sultan. We tend to think of the harem as where the women live, but what it means is the place where you're not on display. 
home is what it means. Islam allowed the Sultan four wives and many concubines. It was a system designed to produce heirs, is what it was. When you look into the actual details of how these things were carried out, it was hardly anything terribly erotic. I mean, the Sultan did not have much choice in his selection of female companions. The Sultan was not in a position to look around and say, I want her, you know, because his mother would have a lot to say about it. With his first wife, Suleiman had a son and heir, Mustafa. But while he was in his mid-thirties, the Sultan fell deeply in love with a Slavic slave girl named Harem. In the West, we know her by a different name, Roxalana. Roxalana would bear him a rival heir and become Suleiman's most trusted confidant. The Sultan was supposed to be protected from any undue influences. He was supposed to be protected from any rivals. And in a way, this creates a vacuum around his person into which the harem life can enter. And so the fact that he was so protected works in a funny way to expose him to the influence of his female companions with whom he spent so much time. And there were tremendously intelligent and ambitious women around him, Roxelana being the most famous of all. Suleiman is a complex character. A man that we know from his own life was capable of the tenderest emotions, both toward his male friends and especially toward his, uh, his, the great love of his life, his wife, Hurem Sultan, and toward his family as well. He had a number of extremely talented sons uh, on whom he lavished a great deal of affection. Suleiman groomed his firstborn son, Mustafa, for power. In the Ottoman tradition, the young prince entered the military and quickly won recognition as a talented general. Mustafa was clearly the heir apparent. For Suleiman, the future of his empire seemed limitless. I am God's slave and sultan of this world. Suleiman would carve on a conquered fortress. I am Suleiman, in whose name the Friday sermon is read in Mecca and Medina. In Baghdad, I am the Shah. In the Byzantine realms, I am the Caesar. And in Egypt, the Sultan. He, of course, at the height of his powers, clearly saw himself as dwarfing all his rivals. Uh, perhaps rightly so. One of Suleiman's greatest rivals was to the east, the empire of the Persian Safavids. This was a Muslim enemy whose rival creed made them fierce antagonists of the Ottomans for centuries. The Safavids were also Turkic in their ethnic origins, and indeed spoke Turkish as a language of daily life. But they were moving into the Muslim world, unlike the Ottomans who were moving into the West. So for the Ottoman Empire, they formed sort of the boundaries, uh, the easternmost uh, boundaries of the Ottoman realm. The Safavid dynasty was Shiite Muslims, bitter rivals to the Sunni Ottomans. According to the Shiites, a leader had to be designated by his predecessor and had to be of the family of Muhammad. According to the Sunni view, it was not designation that was necessary and a person could be a leader of the community without being a direct descendant of Muhammad. This challenge to legitimacy is the basis of the Shiite-Sunni split. A bitter division that still separates the Muslim world to this day. 
and i would say the